Thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, for this annual Czech and Slovak Freedom Lecture. My name is Dan Hamilton. I direct the Global Europe Program at the Woodrow Wilson uh, Center. Uh, before we start, let me say it's such a pleasure to be here to celebrate Czech and Slovak achievements. Uh, I, my wife, his family is from Nebraska, and her whole family are Czech immigrants. Uh, and, there, and many people know there are small communities throughout Nebraska that have this very strong Czech background. So I feel I'm an honorary Czech. Uh, so I'm, I'm delighted to be here. My other very strong recollection is I was with Madeleine Albright as a member of her staff in Independence, Missouri, when we exchanged the accession protocols with the Czech Republic, uh, Hungary and Poland uh, to join NATO. Uh, that was a very emotional moment, and it was a great uh, moment in our history of our alliance and our bilateral relationship. So it's real pleasure here to welcome you all today. Uh, the uh, ambassador of the Czech Republic is going to offer us a welcome, so I'm going to turn to him now uh, to get things going. Thank you again for being with us. Ladies and gentlemen, every year around the 17th of November, we celebrate the anniversary of the Velvet Revolution when freedom ended the communist rule in Czechoslovakia in 1989. We call this occasion a Freedom Lecture. And for years we try to bring you quite a number of distinguished speakers, most of them politicians, activists, former politicians, members of parliament, to speak about freedom and what freedom means for their lives. Yet this year is a little bit different. We cannot meet together in the Budu Wilson Center because of pandemics of coronavirus. And we thought that it shouldn't be a politician who will address you with a freedom lecture today. It should be somebody who is very, very topical for the times we are living in. Mr. Tomáš Sihlás, who is the Czech biochemist, who is the senior director and the vice president of the Gilead company, is exactly that type of person. He's for years involved in developing and research of the drugs connected with HIV, he was very instrumental for bringing the treatment against the Ebola disease. And exactly that drug, Remdesivir, is now tested uh, in more than 35 countries to treat the symptoms of COVID-19. Mr. Tomáš Cihlas is a person who is not a politician, but maybe he can tell us a lot about the freedom from fear, which is exactly what we need this year. Without any further ado, let me invite Mr. Cihlas, who was just a few days ago awarded by the Silver Medal for his contribution to facing the new threats by the President of the Czech Republic, and he agreed to share his thoughts with us today. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. This is Tom Dine, president of the American Friends of the Czech Republic, which uh, I'm pleased to be joining with my new friend Tomas in California as we present this program to you this morning. Uh, the Freedom Lecture is an annual occasion. And as the ambassador just said, uh, He's the first non-politician to participate in this important uh, annual program. Uh, the ambassador also gave Tomasz's background and uh, we've got a lot to talk about today. So why don't we just go ahead and Tomasz, um, this Tom is turning it over to you, the other Tom uh, in California and let us hear what you have to say today. Tomasz Selaj. Thank you, Mr. Dine and Mr. Ambassador for kind introduction. And thank you everyone in the audience for joining us today, despite the difficult circumstances. I would like to start by expressing my sincere gratitude 
to the American Friends of Czech Republic, Friends of Slovakia, the Czech Embassy and the Slovak Embassy in United States for their kind invitation to present the 2020 Czech and Slovak Freedom Lecture. I would also like to extend my thanks to the Woodruff Wilson Center for hosting the lecture. I want to point out here that the name of President Wilson is well known and highly respected in Czechia and Slovakia even today. I have lived and worked in the United States for more than 25 years, but I still keep very close ties to my home country. I have my relatives there, my friends, and many professional colleagues with whom I continue maintaining close connections. All this really amplifies my strong feelings of being honored by today's opportunity to join the list of many prominent figures of Czech and Slovak public, political, diplomatic, and cultural life who were invited to deliver their lectures in previous years. I believe this is the very first time when this lecture is given virtually. And I'm guessing also the first time when it is presented by a scientist. Both of, both of these aspects are quite obvious irregularities in the 20 plus years long history of this wonderful tradition. And we all are very acutely aware why it is this way. We are meeting virtually here today to celebrate and commemorate the long journey of Czechs and Slovak to their freedom. A journey that was led by visionary politicians, dedicated diplomats, well-known artists, and above all, brave students, but not necessarily by scientists. I guess none of us easily realized that fight for freedom does not have to be always against dictators, invaders, or totalitarian parties. Until just now, we could not possibly comprehend that our freedom in the most global as well as the very personal meaning can be threatened by something as simple and banal as a virus, the most primitive form of a parasitic life that cannot even exist or survive on its own. I'm sure we all can feel directly or through some close experience, the impact of serious disease or long difficult illness on our lives. We feel the impact through our own struggles or the struggles and losses of our loved ones, loss of brother or sister to cancer, loss of father to heart disease, suffering of mother or grandmother from Alzheimer disease. Disease then can take away freedom, can cause suffering, but this mostly happens to us on a personal level within our families. And yet, here we are today, not even a year into the global COVID pandemic. We all know the shocking numbers that keep growing every day. And by official counts are now reaching more than 50 million infected people and exceed 1.3 million lives lost around the world. The actual numbers are probably even higher. The lives taken by COVID are most tragic. But many of us probably don't realize that in comparison, cancer kills eight to 10 million people globally every year and cardiovascular disease is twice that. We should not forget these staggering numbers and absolutely should not lose them from our side because of COVID. But there is one difference. These diseases do not spread in families, schools, communities, towns, countries, and continents. They do not threaten economic prosperity, do not take away jobs, family homes, freedom to travel and meet, freedom to give a hug to your grandmother. We all are fighting for our basic freedoms that were taken for granted just a year ago. But this time, we are not fighting dictators or totalitarian regimes. We are fighting an invisible enemy that we cannot touch, hear, or feel. An enemy that became omnipresent in past few months as it keeps spreading everywhere, 
to every single country in the world. This is an enemy we do, did not know just a year ago, and we were not quite ready for it. And this is precisely the moment where science needs to step forward and get to the front line in the fight for freedom. Challenges in fighting new mysterious virus are tremendous. To respond effectively to COVID-19, we needed to know a lot of things that we knew absolutely nothing about just 10 months ago. We needed to understand the virus, what it is, how does it spread, and how to protect people in public to immediately minimize that spread. To do that, we needed quick, sensitive, and reliable diagnostic tests, as well as effective systems for tracking the virus spread in population. At the same time, we need therapies for sick COVID patients in hospitals. And above all, we need a vaccine that could be safe and effective in protecting everyone. We need all those things to start our journey back to freedom. And it is really a daunting task to deal with everything on this list at the same time. But the good news is that even if this is a new virus, scientists don't need to start learning every principle or every concept from the beginning. We have a lot of knowledge and experience to draw from and to build upon to make quick progress. For one, we have known COVID-19 older cousins for some time. SARS since 2003 and MERS since 2012. In the context of this important historical knowledge and experience, I want to mention two outstanding Czech scientists who contributed great deal to our understanding of viruses and their epidemiology, as well as to the development of drugs for the treatment of viral infections, so-called antivirals. The first one is Karel Raška, a Czech doctor and epidemiologist who started his work before World War II and then continued in post-war communist Czechoslovakia. His scientific influence grew quickly, and in 1963, he became a head of the WHO Division of Communicable Diseases. In this capacity, he formed an ambitious program for the eradication of smallpox, and in 1967, he persuaded President Johnson and his staff to back the program financially. It was largely thanks to Rushka's plan that smallpox was eradicated within 10 years. The very first human infectious disease that was left to history. Despite such success, when Rushka returned from his service at WHO in early 1970s, he was persecuted because he publicly criticized the Russian invasion of Czechoslovakia. He was not allowed to lead research, publish or teach, and was forced to retire. Raška died in 1987, and nowadays there are no doubts that the eradication of smallpox was reliably planned and implemented thanks to his efforts and vision. And equally importantly, Rashka's principles of epidemiological surveillance and contact tracing are paramount to our current efforts to curb COVID-19. The second name I want to mention is Antonin Holly. Tony, as he was known among, among his friends and colleagues, was a Czech chemist, one of the founders of modern medicinal chemistry. In mid-1980s, Tony and his team in Prague at the Institute of Organic Chemistry and Biochemistry, or IOCB for short, discovered some of the most important antiviral drugs against HIV and hepatitis viruses, which were later developed into very successful commercial medicines. Holly focused on his research and stayed mostly out of politics, 
Therefore, he could continue his work during normalization years, although not completely freely. Later on, he served as a director of IOCB and stayed at the Institute until his retirement. He died in 2012, just a few days after the very first drug for prevention of HIV infection called Truvada was approved by US FDA. One of the components of Truvada is Holly's drug Tenofovir that is now being used by millions of people around the world as effective treatment and prevention for HIV and viral hepatitis. Holly made the critical discoveries of his drugs together with Eric de Klerk, a renowned Belgian doctor and virologist. De Klerk had the same mindset as Holly. So they took their compounds to pharmaceutical companies, first to Bristol Myers in 1980s, and when that didn't work out, to a small startup company in California called Gilead Sciences. This happened thanks to their contacts with scientist and industry leader, John Martin. John was a chemist by training. Therefore, he spoke the same language as Tony and understood very well the potential of his research. Martin, Holly and de Klerk became close friends and worked together for 25 years to develop several very successful medicines for HIV and viral hepatitis. And it is here to say it is only more impressive that the foundation of this success was laid down at the time when the Iron Curtain was still hanging at the Czech Western border and the collaboration between West and East was not supported by state government. The story of Eric, Tony and John and their work together is described in a captivating book called Cold War Triangle, written by a former ambassador of Belgium to Czech Republic, Renilt Lux. The triangle here, of course, has a big transatlantic span, with one corner in Czechoslovakia, one in Belgium, and the third one in US. If you can imagine it, it would look more like an arch or a bridge, a real monument to international scientific collaboration that ignore all the walls, fences, and barbed wire. You might now be thinking, what exactly the HIV drugs invented in communist Czechoslovakia 35 years ago have to do with COVID and 2020? The answer is quite simple. It is the historical knowledge and the development expertise that Gilead Sciences built since the early 1990s when we started working on Holly's chemical compounds. These early efforts ignited by Holly's chemistry and de Klerk's principles of antiviral drug testing culminated years later in a very different discovery. It was the discovery of remdesivir, the very first drug for the treatment of COVID-19 approved by FDA just a few weeks ago. The somewhat convoluted history of remdesivir started more than a decade ago, when Gilead had been working on new drugs to treat hepatitis C virus, at that time a serious disease of more than 70 million people worldwide. From these efforts, one particular chemi chemical compound emerged with unusually broad activity against many viruses, including coronaviruses. This compound then became a precursor for remdesivir. Gilead chemists continued modifying this precursor, leading to the actual discovery of a molecule with a code name GS5734, which later received a generic name remdesivir. Then in 2014, when the devastating Ebola outbreak emerged in West Africa, Gilead assembled a special team of scientists to work on new drugs against Ebola. And I've had the privilege to lead this team from the very beginning. We started working closely with US government scientists at CDC and Department of Defense. 
who helped with testing our compounds against Ebola virus. When we found out that remdesivir is highly effective against Ebola in the test tube, we moved very quickly and initiated the drug development in summer of 2015. In the end, remdesivir unfortunately didn't show very strong effect against Ebola in patients. But we found out that the drug can, be, can inhibit other viruses like SARS and MERS. Through additional collaborations, mostly with US academic centers, we built on this initial encouraging observation. All data from many studies pointed in the same direction. Remdesivir has a potential to be used against coronaviruses. On the last day of the last year, the news about unusual respiratory illness came from Wuhan. A week later, it was clear that a coronavirus is involved. And another week after, Chinese scientists learned that this is completely new coronavirus and they were able to read its entire genetic code. The first COVID-19 case arrived to US soil in the end of January. The patient number one received remdesivir soon after his symptoms developed and he survived the infection. One patient is exactly what it is. One case, one saved life, but not at all an evidence that the drug actually works. We needed robust evidence from a controlled clinical trial with at least several hundreds of patients. At that time, Almost all cases were in China. So we turned to colleagues from China CDC and started clinical testing of remdesivir in there. Fortunately, the cases in China started dropping dramatically in March, but then the clinical trial with remdesivir could never finish. The growing numbers in US, NIH in collaboration with Gilead, started a new study with more than 1,000 hospitalized patients. When the results came back in the end of April, we learned that remdesivir accelerates the recovery from serious disease in hospitalized patients by five days, in comparison with the control group of patients who were not treated with remdesivir. In parallel with the clinical testing of remdesivir and other previously discovered medicines, a search for brand new drugs that can be combined together for better effect has been initiated. This is not happening just across pharmaceutical and biotech industry, which would be the typical under normal circumstances, but now also through a number of international scientific partnerships, collaborations and consortia that were formed specifically to discover new drugs against COVID. And this brings me back to Prague and the Institute of Organic Chemistry and Biochemistry. Since the times when Tony Holly worked there, the whole institute was changed inside out. It went through major campus expansion in the last decade and became important international scientific hub as it continues to build on the legacy of Professor Holly. IOCB now participates in a number of COVID research efforts together with many international partners who formed a scientific consortium focused on discovery of new drugs for COVID treatment. The consortium now includes about a dozen organizations, including Gilead and other pharmaceutical companies as well as prestigious academic institutions, such as Rockefeller University in New York, Catholic University in Belgium, or University of Toronto in Canada. I'm very excited about this new opportunity to work together with IOCB in Prague, because the Institute has always been a very important partner for Gilead. And this is not only because of the license of antivirals from Professor Holly in 1990s. In fact, 15 years later, in 2006, IOCB and Gilead signed collaboration agreement to establish 
a Gilead-sponsored research center in Prague. The agreement has already been extended twice, each time for five years, and it is now coming to its 15 years of life. The formation and growth of the Gilead Research Center in Prague has been supported and nourished by two excellent scientists and institute directors, Zdeněk Havlas and Zdeněk Hostomský. Both of them led the Prague Institute through tremendous expansion and made it a truly first-class international research center of 21st century. Alongside the drug development for COVID treatment, there is really no other area more important to succeed than the development of safe and effective vaccine that can protect public and shut down the spread of virus around the world. Enormous efforts are spent in the race against time to develop such a vaccine. More than 100 types of candidate vaccines have been designed and several of them progressed into final stages of clinical testing. We all have heard incredibly encouraging news of past few days about the success of Pfizer and BioNTech or Moderna vaccines in large ongoing field studies reducing the COVID transmission by staggering 90%. Although this is still preliminary data, it gives us enormous sense of hope that we'll be, we will beat the invisible enemy and get our freedom back. While the pandemic is nowhere near to being under control, we should really recognize that a tremendous scientific progress in the fight against this new virus has been made. And it was made over an extremely short period of time. We now have rapid tests, we have drugs in clinical trials, and we have very encouraging results from studies with several vaccines. But we still need to keep learning from the virus itself and from each other. We are learning lessons that will be critical for us to be ready for future pandemics if they come. You might be asking, what are those lessons? They are few and simple. Face masks work, social distancing works, scientific collaboration and partnership running far and wide across borders work. Objective and factually correct public communication about the risks of the pandemic's works. Wake public messaging, twisting the truth about the risk and potential consequences of the virus spread do not work. And complacency definitely does not work. I am proud of my Czech scientific heritage. And I'm grateful for the scientific training from my early years as graduate student in Prague. I am grateful for the incredible privilege to continue building on the scientific legacy of Professor Holly through taking a part in the fight for our freedom against COVID. And I'm exceptionally grateful for Gilead's continuing support of connections with Czech scientific community. Because for me, this really symbolizes a, a great example of true global science without walls and borders, a science that is and will continue to be critically important, not only for stopping COVID, but also for solving all future existential challenges of our global society. Thank you for listening. Tomas, thank you. That was brilliant. Thank you so much. And it gives us a better sense uh, of the depth involved in trying to resolve our current uh, uh, phantom and, and uh, that which is trying to reduce our freedoms. Uh, one of your, I, I took your lecture today as a case study, as a case study of how uh, 
international science and even internal nationalism can play a part. Now, I just referred to nationalism. We've heard from the Russians that they have something. We've heard from the president of the Czech Republic that the Chinese have something. Could you comment, um, could you comment, Tomas, please, about what the Russians are doing and what the Chinese are doing and how this plays into your thesis? I think, thank you for the question, Tom. I think uh, nowadays, right, with, with the significant threat to every country. So I think every country that has a means, that has a infrastructure, that has a scientific uh, knowledge, I think they are trying to, in the first place, develop some drugs and develop vaccine. And I think this, this is very strategic to actually have the access to such vaccine. You know, I can only say what uh, we are doing at Gilead, right? I don't have any detailed information how good or, or, or bad the Russian vaccine or Chinese vaccine is. But I have to say that I personally know a number of both Russian and Chinese scientists who are very creative, who are, who are very productive. So they very well might be capable of generating their own vaccine. Uh, but I think it's really important for us to keep a, an eye what's happening here in the United States and in Europe and when the vaccine will be available here. And I'm, a, I'm incredibly, incredibly uh, optimistic now after the recent data that this will happen very soon. Thank you. Thank you for your honesty <laughs> of what we know and what we don't know. Let's return uh, to what's going on inside the Czech Republic, particularly Prague. Are there more, is there more than one place where research, serious science is taking place on a whole host of vaccines and antiviral uh, therapeutics? Uh, I'm sure that beside the Institute of Organic Chemistry and Biochemistry, which I am really closely associated with, you know, the Czech Academy of Sciences has a number of the top institutions, whether it's the Institute of Molecular Genetics or or Institute of the Physiology. And I think all these uh, academic uh, groups, I think they feel tremendous responsibility to understand the disease and, and to help to navigate all the challenges. Uh, there are certainly also uh, institutions in Brno and we uh, mm -hmm. have known and, and collaborated with some of them um, and they immediately after the pandemic reached Europe, I think they turned into uh, using their means against the COVID-19 and they also collaborate with the Institute of Organic Chemistry and Biochemistry. I haven't really mentioned Slovakia in my uh, lecture and I, I really apologize for that. Um, I know there is an Institute of Virology of the Slovak Academy of Sciences that uh, in past, you know, that was the institution where many excellent scientists work with the strong connections internationally. So I'm sure there also the, the new breakthrough research is happening. So I'm glad you asked that question and answered it yourself. So the Institute of Organic Chemistry and Biochemistry in Prague and maybe some others in both uh, Slovakia and, and Czech, in uh, Czechia. But are there equivalent institutions in the United States besides the big privately, private corporate pharmaceuticals? Well, I think in, in US, the, you know, the role of government scientists, the government institutions like the National Institute of Health, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases of NIA. That's where Tony Fauci works. Yes. Uh, that's a bit different system uh, than the, the uh, Academy of Sciences in Czech Republic, for example. But, you know, I think NIH to some extent is a powerful equivalent of that. And uh, I've been a part of the many collaborations and discussions that NIH is on organizing. And I think they are doing the tremendous job to lead the uh, fight against the COVID and coordinate both across industry 
as well as academia and, and the government, because all these sectors ultimately need to come together to make the big things happen, right? Because the development of vaccine cannot happen just with one isolated sector. It Everybody has to come together and, uh, and lead to make it happen. Great. Okay, so we're now reading in, and we're all excited by what Pfizer is doing um, and the others. But our, but I've read also, but I have not received the names of other uh, research pharmaceuticals, corporate ph pharmaceuticals. Can you can you name who else is in this competition to mm -hmm. produce these vaccines? I think first it's it's really good to see that you know many companies that have the means and infrastructure stepped up and trying to develop the vaccine as quickly as possible, right? In the end, when you realize, when you think about flu vaccine, there is not a single flu vaccine. There is about five or eight different flu vaccines. Each of them is produced slightly differently. So you don't generate a bottleneck when, when you need to, to produce the millions and millions of the flu vaccines every winter. And the same has to be the case for COVID-19, right? because the need for the vaccine would be such enormous that one company would not be possible to produce those volumes and amounts of the vaccine. So I think it is great uh, to see that, you know, not only Pfizer in collaboration with the German uh, biotech company BioNTech or Moderna or companies like Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, um, they all have uh, their programs uh, for vaccines. They are all slightly different. They may be used a slightly different platform. But I think ultimately, you're kind of, you know, hitching a bets on the multiple targets. And that's, that's very important because not every vaccine may necessarily work. But it, I mean, ideally, if multiple vaccines are efficacious, they can be produced in parallel and can be quickly distributed. So I'm not, I'm now I want to get down and dirty with these vac supposed vaccines. And what I've been reading is that you've both uh, uh, Pfizer and, and um, Moderna, Moderna are keeping these refrigerated, fro basically frozen. And I don't know if that's done with these other flu vaccines that you earlier mentioned, but how does this get distributed in a general society that only has a refrigerator in a in a kitchen with maybe a freezer in it and maybe not. So uh, well I think you know to to basically I, I'm not the vaccine expert, right? I'm expert on the antiviral drug. So my understanding in the first place is basically from reading probably the very similar news as you all are reading. But I think the distribution chain for the vaccine is a very challenging task, especially if you need such volumes, right? It doesn't happen overnight. And that's why I think there are things like the operation warp speed that's gonna bring the government, it's gonna bring in the Department of Defense and the operational experience to do these things on the large scale. You know, to which extent, if it's need, if the cold, so-called cold chain you know, if you need to keep it frozen, refrigerated, you, you have to rely on this cold chain for transport and for storage. Uh, I mean, that's a logistical problem, but it's not impossible. Many of the flu vaccines need to be refrigerated. So, so the short-term solution is to have the vaccine that still needs to be kept cold. But I think longer term, you know, there are means how to make the vaccines better how to make uh, them more stable uh, so that they can be uh, perhaps uh, uh, stored even at room temperature. And that would uh, facilitate the distribution of the large volumes. And we are not quite there yet, I think, uh, but th that's a longer term goal that I, I think it's possible to achieve. Yes, everything I've read about Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna, uh, Moderna is mm -hmm. that um, these are multiple dosages. That's the two doses, right? Yeah, well, what so, about the single dosage? Mm -hmm. Which again, poses a little bit of challenge and it may not be the final solution, right? We, you know that your flu shot is a single shot. 
but yeah. you have to get it every year, right? So the question here is, even if it's two shots, months apart, it's one month apart, I think both of them, uh, is the immunity be long enough so you don't have to come back next year and get another two shots, right? We don't know that. And I think the difference of the coronavirus is that it's very stable. It's a lot more stable virus than influenza. Influenza changes every year. So every year, you know, we encounter a slightly different influenza virus in the population. And the vaccine has to be changed every year to kind of match and tailor the virus that we expect will emerge next winter. This may not be the case necessarily for the coronavirus. So one vaccine may last longer, uh, but that's remained to be seen still. What about oral taking in of this vaccine? Uh, there are efforts in, I think, biotech industry to actually develop like a pill vaccine, uh, yeah. but there's nowhere close to any approved product. You know, it's it's sort of very much in the early stages of the uh, concept proving and exploration. That's going to take a long time. Uh, so I think for now, we will be relying primarily on, uh, you know, on the needle and and the injection as we do with the uh, flu vaccine. Uh, there are options for intranasal uh, spray. That's one flu vaccine. And I think that that might possibly be a case for coronavirus in future as well. As someone who's personally involved with insulin on a more than a daily basis, uh, all of those with oral intake or inhaling through the, the nose don't work. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think for insulin, that's that's very different problem, right? Of the delivery actually into the bloodstream. Uh, it could be different for the vaccine. I think flu, there is one vaccine called Flumist and that's actually intranasal and uh, people can get it if they want to. All right, well, so will these me new medications keep people out of hospitals, off of ventilators? I think that's the really the hope right here. Um, I think in, in, you know, in the treatment of viral infections, there is one clear rule. The sooner you start the treatment, the better outcome you will get. Yes. Right? So if you translate that into the problem of the COVID-19, it means that people should be sort of preventively treated as soon as they are diagnosed with COVID-19 so that they don't spread the virus further and particularly the populations that have the higher risk for complications, right? O o the, o the older people, people with cardiovascular disease, uh, people with diabetes. So they can be treated with antivirals ideally before they come to the hospital, because when they are in the hospital, the treatment uh, often can be less efficacious. So I'm gonna address you now as someone with a moral background and a moral backbone. Will these vaccines create a larger gap between haves and have-nots? Will the, those who can afford them get them and those who can't afford them not get them and therefore we separate the populations further apart? Well, does the flu vaccine create such a gap? I'm, I would say maybe not. I'm not aware of it, right? It's, a, I think most of the health insurance, uh, they cover the vaccines. I think the gap is maybe not so much between the wealthy and less wealthy here. I think this is the very basic uh, medical need that should be covered for everyone, not just in the United States, right? It's more between the, the the nations that are fully developed and nations that are middle and low income countries, right? How the access to the vaccine will be there because they don't have the means, most of them to develop their own vaccine. And so there are, you know, from my experience from the antiviral drug world, there are ways how you can create and generate the access programs. Uh, and Gilead has been participating in one of those for many, many years and thanks to that the drug Tenofovir that I've mentioned from Tony Holly actually is reaching millions of people in Africa. Mm -hmm. So there are ways how you can engage, you know, generic companies to 
produce the vaccines and drugs at lower cost so that they are affordable also for the low income countries. How do, now please put on your corporate cap. You've got a team of rivals out there to coin another expression uh, in a political context, but this is political. How do Pfizer and the other companies like Merck and, and GlaxoSmithKline and Eli Lilly and Sophie, Amgen, et cetera, how do, how do you interact and how do you interact without violating monopoly laws? I think, it, you know, the, the intellectual property, property and, you know, the, the invention has always been important for the innovation in pharmaceutical industry. But I think the boundaries are dissolving to a large extent in the COVID circumstances, right? So I think uh, I personally witnessed a number of uh, collaborations partnerships and consortia across the pharma industry uh, to be in the, in the, together in the solving the problem, right? One of them, for example, is the active consortium that NIH is leading. And that brought together all the large pharmaceutical companies, including the Gilead, J&J, uh, Roche, uh, Sanofi, uh, all those you mentioned, right? And the there is a group of executives that is basically uh, meeting on a very regular basis and keep they keep the pulse on the development of the pandemics and uh, discuss the uh, most relevant and highest priority directions. And NIH is then taking some of the products from the pharmaceutical companies into their own clinical trials um, and leading those clinical trials. So. That's at the front of the immediate drug development, but also what I mentioned in terms of the discovering new drugs, you know, the consortium that Gilead is participating in an IOCB. There's other companies like the Pfizer, Novartis, Takeda, and, uh, and they, they discuss the ideas and directions much more openly than it used to be for, for other therapeutic areas. Is there a difference between smallpox vaccine and those for the coronavirus? And how do they work differently? Yeah, I mean, there is the huge difference. We don't need to use the smallpox vaccine anymore, right? There are the stockpiles of the smallpox vaccine at the strategic places that uh, are ready to be deployed if uh, smallpox comes back. But it's been eradicated for 40 years now. Uh, the difference here is, I think, in, in, at the time when smallpox vaccine was needed in 1960s, right, for the eradication program that I mentioned, uh, the means of the biology and biotechnology were not as developed as they are today. So the only thing how you can make vaccine is to create an attenuated virus that is somehow derived from the natural virus. And that's what happened with the smallpox. It's highly attenuated virus uh, that doesn't replicate in people, doesn't cause the disease, but triggers the immune response. While for the coronavirus vaccine, all these uh, so-called recombinant technologies where uh, the new platforms are being used that are manufactured synthetically on completely different basis, right? So the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine is not really a live virus or anything. It's just a piece of genetic material that you, that, that you uh, give to the people. And then the genetic material starts producing pieces of the virus, but the virus never comes together. And these are T species then induce the immune response. So the principle is completely different. The effectivity might still be the same because the smallpox vaccine is pretty damn effective. Right, for sure. One last question, Tomas. You represent both symbolically and substantively American, Czech, closeness, tight relationships. What more can we do to tighten that bilateral relationship? Well, I mean, there are many levels 
you can think about the question, right? At, at the scientific level, I think we are doing quite a bit, right? After the world opened, and I, I sort of was one who had the advantage of in 1994, had the opportunity to come to come to Gilead for my postdoctoral fellowship. So just, you know, opening the world meant a lot for the young scientists from Czech Republic to get experience in the world. Uh, what is important also is to uh, work, you know, uh, more uh, inclusively so that you create the lasting or sustained opportunities for scientists in, in Czech Republic, right? For example, through uh, supporting the development of the startup biotech companies through, you know, the capital investment. So there are actually opportunities for scientists who get training abroad to come back to Czech Republic or Slovakia and, and participate in the local businesses. Uh, I mean, there is a way how the two nations can interact at the very different levels, cultural, political, uh, which I can speak probably a little bit less to, but they are equally important. Well, I wanna end where I began. This has been a brilliant presentation and I congratulate you on what you're doing for all of us. So thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity and thanks very much for the real honor to deliver the lecture this year. And well, you have honored us and I wanna thank the Woodrow Wilson Center and everybody else involved, uh, including the Friends of Slovakia. So I now turn to Scott Thayer from, from the Friends of Slovakia to, to end this program. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, Tomasz, for a very interesting uh, exposition on vaccine development. Uh, some of the people who are watching this will already know that Tom and I worked together uh, in the mid-90s on a program called Support for East European Democracy. I think that's probably how we, we it's fitting that we end up again working on, uh, on, on Central Europe. Um, yes. But the point of that program was, and perhaps the point or the, or the chutzpah of the program was <laughs> that uh, these begotten nations, these begotten governments in Central Europe would learn you know, how to do things right from, uh, from the United States and others. Uh, now we fast forward 25 years and uh, since I'm from the Friends of Slovakia, I can speak to the Slovak experience. Uh, in March, when the severity of the pandemic was becoming clear, uh, Slovakia sprang into action. Within 10 days of identifying its first case, it went into lockdown. Its borders were sealed, schools and restaurants were closed, and face masks were made mandatory in public places. With some of the country's most visible public figures, including the president and prime minister, wearing them to set the example. Uh, this swift action was all the more remarkable considering that elections had just been held and a new government was being formed and sworn in. Uh, Slovakia resulted uh, to being the European nation with the lowest per capita rate during the first wave. Fast forward then to now, Slovakia, the rest of Europe and the world have been hit by the second wave. Um, it, would be, it would not be unfair, I think, to suggest that a certain complacency took hold uh, in Slovakia as it did here. But nevertheless, it has again responded with vigor and a bit of controversy. You know, uh, swimming pools, uh, fitness centers, cultural events, theaters, et cetera, are closed. Retail shops are limiting what they're doing. Uh, customers, uh, restaurants are only allowed to serve outdoors. Uh, and with the, with the exception of the all-important hockey and soccer games, uh, large <laughs> public outdoor events are, uh, are being uh, restricted. Uh, and, but of course, everybody is wearing masks inside, outside, and on public transport. Perhaps most interestingly, uh, Slovakia has adopted a testing program under which uh, roughly 6 million tests have been administered in the month of November to the entire population. Uh, 
it seems to me that in a certain way, uh, the student has become the master uh, as a result of your work and mine, Tom, uh, so long ago. And with that observation, um, I'm going to thank everyone out there electronically for joining us uh, for a very interesting presentation and uh, invite you to uh, join us again a year from now uh, when the Czech and Slovak Freedom Lecture will again be held. Thank you all and good afternoon. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Scott. And Tomáš, one last thing. Scott and I are gonna sign a certificate and send it to you in, in California as a token of our appreciation plus another envelope. So again, Scott, thank you. And Tomáš, all the best and, and keep well yourself. Bye-bye, Thanks everybody. very much. Thank you. You all have a great day and stay safe. Yes, sir.